Welcome to The Green Room, the podcast that bridges the gap between church production and every other aspect of a worship service. From programming directors to worship leaders, volunteers to vendors, tune in for inspiring conversations, expert advice, and a unique look into the intricate puzzle of church production. Here's your host, Aaron Freeman. Hey, Dennis. Um, Hey, thanks so much for being on The Green Room. I really appreciate you coming on. Wow, Aaron, what an honor and uh, so glad you're doing this. uh, No, no, no. uh, I've been, uh, been looking forward to it. No, thank you. I mean, um, I know you've uh, we've known each other for a while, uh, volunteering at Gwinnett, b- both of us volunteering at Gwinnett, and then right. me eventually on, on staff at North Point and then at, at Gwinnett. So it's really cool to sit down and talk, uh, talk chat production and chat um, service stuff. I know you've seen a lot. Um Mm-hmm. So, uh, I would, I'd really love to hear, uh, just how you got involved with, uh, production in general, and then it, how you got involved at production at maybe Gwinnett and some of the things that you've done and seen, just, we can go from there. Sure. Be glad to. Um, it was, uh, uh quite a while back when I got involved in production, the, uh, the church that I attended with my parents um, as a kid in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, it was a uh, a big mainline denominational church, and it was before we had all of the technology and production that we have now. We we came in, um, the lights were all on, you know, as bright as they would go. Somebody flipped the, the switch and turned the uh, PA system on, as we called yeah. it. And uh, the choir would um, lead us in, in a few hymns. The pastor would uh, preach from the pulpit behind the microphone. And um, we'd pray at the end, and we would all go home. And my dad uh, was an usher at the church, and, which meant that he stood in the back a lot. <clears throat> and uh, as a 12-year-old, I saw something that really caught my attention on the back wall of the church. It was a, a row of light switches. And there were two um, big knobs about four inches in diameter to the left of those light switches. So I got curious one day, and um, this was uh, before church. I rode up with with my dad early because he had to uh, get the bulletins and make sure they were all ready to be handed out and whatnot. So I was running around and fooling around in there, and I went and turned one of those big knobs, and the lights began to dim. And I turned it the other way, and the they came back up, and I thought, wow, this is really cool. And um, there were only two of them. There were, was uh, two rows of these big, round pendant lights hanging from the ceiling. One knob controlled those, and the other knob controlled um, some offset lighting that sort of uh, shined up into the, the structure. Oh, yeah. And I thought, wow, wow. Uh, wouldn't it be cool if we could use this in the worship service somehow? And uh, I suggested to my dad one day that, um, hey, maybe, you know, after we finish uh, singing hymns and go to prayer, um, could we turn the lights down a little bit and kind of get people in the, you know, in the mood to pray? And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, don't touch those fun. <laughs> <laughs> But um, long story short, eventually, you know, somebody said, hey, that sounds like something we can try. So I got to be the one to stand at the back of the church and at the appropriate time, dim the light. And then at the appropriate time, um, bring the the intensity back up. That was my first shot at production. Nice. uh, From there, um, I had some friends who were in uh, a very early version of a contemporary Christian band uh, in Jacksonville. They were called Tim Folk. And they had, some, they had enough gear to fill the back of the station wagon. Um, and I uh, went to, you know, several of their concerts and, um, you know, flip switches for them and, and ran faders and like that. And I thought, this is, this is kind of cool. I think I would like to, to uh, do this. Um, but uh, I figured out pretty quick that, um, I wasn't going to get much to eat and maybe not have a roof over my head, uh, unless I did it, you know, full time on the road, you know, all the time. And that really, um, didn't interest me that much. So, um, I got interested, uh, instead in the fire service 
and emergency medical services and decided to make that my career. But I've always um, kind of, you know, stayed on the edge of, uh, of worship production in whatever church I was in. Nice. That's so awesome. That was, that was the beginning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, and now, now you're volunteering at Gwinnett. Uh, you've been, how long have you been a speaker host um, at, with, with Gwinnett or with, with us? Uh, every, well, ever since Gwinnett Church launched, actually a little before Gwinnett Church launched, I was, uh, was on staff at, uh, at another, uh, big mainline church here in Gwinnett County, uh, as the, um, technical director for contemporary worship. And a fellow by the name of Jay Desai, uh, he and I, I think I'm pretty sure you know Jay. Um, oh, I knew the I, name. Yeah. Uh, he and I worked together there for a while. And he reached out to me one day and, and said, Hey, you know, what, what are you doing? And, uh, so we chatted for a while and he said, I'm going to throw something out there for you. And, you know, you can, you can take it and run with it or, or leave it. But, um, to, uh, some, some friends of mine from North Point are launching a new church in Gwinnett County up in the Sugar Hill area. And they need people like you to, you know, to help them get it up and running and help them launch. And, um, at the time I had, had, uh, probably about maxed out my skill set at uh, the church I was at and wanted a, a new challenge. Um, I had recently retired from the fire service, so had plenty of time on my hands and, and my schedule was pretty flexible. So I decided to look into that and, um, talk with, uh, um, Jeff Henderson and Lauren S. B. Matt Atkins few other people and kind of got connected and plugged in there. And um, we uh, had a night of worship at a church in Norcross, uh, even before we launched going to church over at the Civic the Center. And uh, so I speaker hosted that and kind of, have kind of stayed in the same role ever since. Um, I do a few other things, too. Uh, if we have a live speaker and there's stage transitions that need to be done or props that need to need to be moved or something like that. And uh, I do that as well. Nice. How was, how was the transition from, uh, from a staff member in production on a church to uh, volunteering in production at another church? Um, was that transition, um, was it was it easy? Was it like, hey, I would do this differently, but like, I'm not really in charge anymore? Or like, what what was that? How was that for you? No, the, um, that really uh, went very well. Uh, the church that I was at um, was uh, they were were doing contemporary worship, but they, um, you know, excellence was something that was. You know, hey, yeah, we know there's churches out there that do it better than us, but we're happy with what we're doing, and um, you know, we're, we're just going to keep on doing what we're doing. Well, to be very honest with you, that was a little frustrating to me. And having been to uh, services at North Point um, and seeing the uh, just the, uh, the the high standard of production there um that really interested me and and i decided that was something that uh, i wanted to be a part of and as far as the you know the transition um it just you know it went went very smoothly um i didn't feel that that i had enough to contribute to say hey why don't we do it this way because they were just doing uh, just a uh, a wonderful job as it was I was just happy to, you know, to jump and, and be able to learn some new things from them. That's cool. I mean, uh, just doing, I guess, different things than what the other church was doing. So, uh, right, the, um, the whole um, uh, worship experience uh, was just totally different. Uh, the I came from, they had sort of taken the traditional model of worship and tried to sort of squeeze it into the the mold of a you know a contemporary worship service and uh, kind of like you know trying to put a square peg in a round hole it, you can get it in there if yeah you, if you <laughs> hard enough. 
Yeah, but like we're we're gonna do the same thing we've always been doing, but we're gonna do some Chris Tomlin songs. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna expect a different result. And right. somebody told me one time that that's the definition of insanity. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad that 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 transition wasn't so bad. Um, what have what are some of the learnings that you've done or that you've had as speaker host? Actually, I really don't know how many churches sort of use that role of speaker host and stuff like that. So, like, take me through a, a morning of, and this is good for me to know too. A, a morning of of coming on and being a speaker host for a Sunday. Like, what's that look like? That is sort of um, being the the person to uh, make sure that everyone is in place when they're supposed to be in place. The band is loaded and ready to go when they're supposed to be. The um, Any live speakers, including the person, you know, that's just doing the welcome or maybe is doing an announcement, make sure that they're uh, mic'd in the way that, that they want to be. And, uh, of course, I coordinate whoever is, is uh, doing the audio because uh, some people prefer to, you know, hold a hand mic in front of them and other people like the hand free uh apparatus. So just make sure that they're they're comfortable. And uh, I always um, you know, introduce myself to them and kind of, you know, chat with them a little bit, especially if it's somebody that uh, I haven't worked with before and don't know real well. Uh and let them know that I'm here for them. Uh if they need something, you know, if they need a tissue, if they need you know, a cough drop or a bottle of water or something like that. Um, all you got to do that and I'll, I'll get it for you right away. If they need me to hold their phone while they're on stage or something like that, I, you know, I'm more than happy to do that and just make them feel, especially that someone, if it's a guest, um, guest speaker coming from another church or another organization or whatever, just make sure that they're comfortable in the environment. Uh, all the way down to um, how's the temperature here, you know, for you up, up on stage? Is it too cool or too hot? Because uh, right. I can communicate with the operations team and, you know, have a change made there if it's necessary. Wow. So, so it's, it's like like kind of like stage manager, making sure people are on stage when they need to be on stage. And then like maybe even more than half hospitality for the speaker or special guest and stuff like that. Right. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and, uh, I have direct communication via the, the compact uh, to the producer of the worship service. And they're the ones that actually, you know, cues me when to, when to load the speaker and, and that sort of thing. But it's also, there's a benefit, uh, I believe, to having another set of eyes um, right down front just in case there is something, you know, uh, somebody gets sick in the crowd or passes out or something like that, because um, the people that are front of house, you know, they have a handful. They've got things that they're doing. They're looking down at consoles and, you know, moving face and things like that. It's good to have uh, as many pairs of eyes as you can, just, you know, just kind of casually watching people and making sure that they're okay. Okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's great. I've been in church services where, you know, somebody's passed out and, and needed medical attention. And, um, if, you know, the people around them are, are looking like, well, what do we do? And, you know, if, if I, then I can, I can say something right away. Yeah. What was the training like for that? Did you just sort of jump in and figure it out as you went? Or were the staff members saying, hey, this is exactly what we want you to do? This is how we want this person to feel? Okay, go do it. Or what was that like? No, it um, it was kind of a a two way street. Um, okay. I got got to input some things and and say, hey, this is you know uh, this is what I'm planning to do this morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so and so the the speaker that's coming in hasn't been here before. Um, you know, I'm going to chat with them a little bit, make make sure they know where the restroom is, and you know, all of that kind of stuff. Is you know, is that okay? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's almost always affirmative. Yeah, um, of course. If it, you know, if it was somebody that you know, um, I don't know. There, there are some speakers who um, are you know really kind of uh, preparing themselves mentally to give their talk or whatever. 
And it's not that they don't want to be bought. It's just that they're trying to get in their zone and everything. And if I recognize, then, you know, I kind of back off and, you know, just, just let them know I'm there. Just be present uh, in case they reach out to me for anything. But I, I don't do too much talking if, if that seems to be the case. I just try to kind of read them and see, you know, see what kind of vibe they're giving off and, and go from there. And, of course, Every Sunday we do have a, uh, we put out a, uh, you know, a, a run sheet for the worship service. So, you know, blow by blow exactly what we want to do, what the, the vision of the, uh, the team that put the service together is. And I feel like it's, uh, it's my job to be a part of the team in bringing that vision to life, listening for cues and uh, making sure that people are in the room at the proper time to be able to to load on stage and those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, if the pastor doesn't go up, there's 40 minutes of the of the service that's not happening. So right, right. <laughs> tight as you know too. Um, we we don't like for the band to finish the song and the lights come up on stage and no one's there, and then somebody walks out. Oh, good morning, church. You know, and it's it's just you know, part of that, uh, that culture of excellence and high standard that, you know, we, um, we want them to, to be there on time when the lights come up and, and mm-hmm. be ready. Yeah. There's, yeah. Be ready. But I mean, some, sometimes people, they'll just bolt out of the seat and they're up on stage for a whole, uh, down course. And you're like, well, all right, well, that's going to be awkward, but, uh, and some people prefer to load from backstage as well and that you know that's fine um if i need to, to be back there then somebody will say you know hey need you to cue the, the speaker from backstage this morning and we'll work, work through that otherwise if they're you know if they prefer to load some backstage and they're good at, at queuing themselves or the like the person running monitors can queue them or something that's fine too i'll i'll still be in my position um probably on the on the front row stage right and you know with my eyes open and ready to to get on the comm if i need to that's awesome um have you had any uh just wild crazy experiences that you can that you can share or want to share (laughs) um yeah there's one comes to mind i mean you know in this day and age we we always have to you know have our eyes open for anyone who uh, would come into the church to do any kind of harm. And there was one situation where, um, right after the, uh, the 915 service ended, a, uh, young man, probably high school age, um, with a backpack on, uh, entered the stage. And, you know, I, I had eyes on him, uh, several other people you know, in the room had eyes on him as well. And we were, you know, kind of ready to um, not, you know, make a big scene or anything, but interrupt if, you know, if he had bad, bad intentions. He did not. Um, he was just, you know, he was a goofy kid and, and he wanted to see what it was like to walk across the stage. And so Man. he did. <laughs> oh, but, geez. Yeah, uh, people... People are weird. We have uh, just recently had a guy that just fell asleep during the message and was just sort of like leaning back in his chair. And he wasn't, I mean, like service had ended, people had left and we're just like, well, we didn't really know he was asleep, but he was just sort of like, not not, not like this, but you know, he's just like, he's kind of moving. He, he was acting kind of odd and we we're like, what's going on? So, you know, we had the, the undercover guys come and like poke him and be like, Hey, what do you what what's up? What are you doing? And he's like, oh, and he just got up and left. And we're like, yeah. man, can't be doing stuff like that. No, no, that's you know that's what we tell the kid. Um, we said, hey, you know, I know you're uh, you're in high school, and you know somebody might have aired you or something like that. But please don't do that again because you're putting yourself in danger by doing that. Someone could see you and and overreact, and we don't want that to happen. We want you to, you know, go out of here with 
you know, with all of your, your fingers and toes and everything mm-hmm. else. In time. <laughs> yeah. I remember so, um, multiple times. He, oh, sorry. What was that? He was, he was very understanding. He said, Oh yeah, yeah, I get it. That was, that was dumb on my part. I apologize. I mean, I guess it's kind of a good thing that he felt comfortable enough at, at the church he was at to, to do that. Uh, but, um, but yeah, let's not walk up on stage when you're not supposed to be there. Um, but yeah, I, I remember multiple times we would get calls over the radio of like backpacks left in the, in the hallway and, and stuff like that. It's just, um, it is kind of crazy just that we have to be concerned about those kind of things, kind of suspicious behavior and stuff. Um, but we have to, I mean, it's, it's our responsibility. You, you semi, you know, being the speaker host looking out, but then staff members making sure that everybody's safe and can come and worship safely. So it's crazy. Right. Well, one, one of the, the pillars of, you know, our um, worship service is keeping it as distraction free as possible. And, uh, you know, I, I have really taken that to heart. And even when it comes to um, sort of eyeballing the stage before um, guest services open the door for a service to make sure that uh, somebody hasn't left their jacket, you know, sitting the drum riser or, I mean, if there's water bottles up there that they're standing up straight and that they're full bottles of water, not empty ones that are rolling around on the stage. Oh, yeah. Just, you know, little things like that. If we have uh, cabling that, uh, is attached to the, uh, you know, the, the plasma or whatever that it, uh, flakes out straight across the floor, doesn't coil up and make, you know, coils that are picked up on camera. And, I, you know, yeah. Like I love to hear that. Yeah. Just try to keep the distractions to the minimum and view as a good number. <laughs> <laughs> that actually bit me, uh, this, this past Sunday. Um, I did that like before the doors were open, uh, had this stuff preset, uh, for our special that we were doing. And, um, I scanned the stage. There's a mic stand there. I grabbed the mic stand, take it off because worship leaders usually load with their stand. At least I thought right. turns out he had preset that for his opener and I had taken it off stage and Ooh. openers go. And he's like, where's my mic? And I'm like, oh, and he, Mike was over here. He's on, he was going to load from this side of stage. I was like, that's on me. That's I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, But I was also thinking, I'm like, we didn't, um, we never talked about like presetting his microphone. So like if, and that's for, that's for me uh, on staff to like, make sure that I talk about all those things. Like, Hey, for this, for this segment, are we, are we setting his microphone or, you know, is she bringing or what, what are the worship leaders bringing in for this and that? So that's right. something that's a mental note for me moving forward to make sure that we know who's loading with what and what needs to be preset. So I'm like, oh, I'm really sorry. So I, I went and apologized to him in the green room after, well, I guess it was during service. And I just, I was like, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Cause that, yeah. <laughs> They're they're out there vulnerable all the by themselves, not all by themselves, but just like more vulnerable than I am standing in the back in in black clothing. So I'm just like I'm so sorry, and I was like I will have your mic set and turned on. You don't have to worry about it for the eleven fifteen. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up um, because that's something else that I find unique um, among many things in the the North Point system is we. Um, we strive for excellence, but we don't obsess on perfection uh, and mm-hmm. make them try not to, or, you know, when, when something doesn't go exactly right, or, you know, a prop falls over or something like that. Um, we don't, you know, say who did that? You know, we're never going to act again. Now we, you know, we make an extra effort to go to the person that, you know, maybe was responsible and say, Hey, you know, Pat them on the back, put your arm around them, and say, hey, "That happened. Don't worry about it. We, you know, we'll get it uh, the next service. Not a big deal." So, and I just love our, our, our culture um, with that church, and I hope it's universal through. Uh, well, I wish it was universal through every church. Unfortunately, it's not. 
but uh, I'm just I'm hugely blessed that it is at Gwinnett Church and, and that I get to be a part of it. To make a mistake and, and know that nobody's going to be coming after me with a baseball bat. <laughs> Don't you do that? You know? uh, uh, well, and, and that's, so, that's sort of what the podcast and stuff like that is really geared around. I, I use the word geared. I'm sorry. It's not about the gear. It's more about having those kind of conversations about how we, how production, I, I feel production should be, how production should be seen. Like you said, uh, we're not concerned about it being perfect, but we want to strive and make every effort for it to be excellent. And that's right. making sure that everything's loaded and stuff is spiked on stage and conversations are had before as much as you can before with volunteers and stuff like that. Um, and that actually brings me to, uh, I guess, a, another good question with um, you volunteering for so long. What's it like with like staff transitions with production director leaves or there's a new audio guy and or a new producer? And it's like, well, I don't really do it that way. I'd like you to speak or host this way. Like, I don't know if that's the case, but from your perspective, volunteer perspective, what, what are those things like? As long as it's communicated uh, in a way, like like you said, and and I don't mind, you know, someone being very uh, direct and saying, you know, this is how I'd like it done now, because um, they're the one that is is ultimately responsible for the product because they're the one that gets the paycheck. I mean, let's let's face it. I look the way I look at it is I'm here to help them. Uh, achieve their vision for the worship service. And if it's different than, um, you know, the last person who was in that position, then that's fine. Uh, I love doing new things. I love things, changing things around, changing things up, maybe sitting in a different location. They may, you know, prefer the speaker host to be two rows back, stage left instead of, you know, where I've been sitting for all these years. I don't know. You know, as long as it's communicated clearly, clearly, important i i would prefer that they don't come in and say hey i'm i'm the new guy and uh we're going to be changing a few things here and there and you know you'll you'll see things uh that are new come up and stuff i would rather them say i'm so and so this is how i prefer uh the you know stage transitions to be done uh props coming from both sides rather than just from one side you know things like that and um, that clarity is uh, is a gift rather than uh, something, you know, like, oh, here, here we go again. You know, we're changing everything. I take that as, as a gift that that new director is, is giving me because I know then exactly, you know, what they're looking for, what they expect. Okay. That's, that's really good to know. Uh, yeah, because I've just stepped into a new role myself, and and uh, that's probably I probably can be more clear on some things. Not that I've gone in and just upset the apple cart or anything like that, but just sure. slowly rolling things out rather than surprising people with things like, "Hey, this is this is we're moving forward. This is some things that we're going to start trying." Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, uh, and other you know, kind of a another facet of that too is, you know, staff does need to communicate privately from time to time, even on Sunday morning. Uh, if something didn't go quite right or they, you know, they want to make a quick change or something like that, there's a, you know, little huddle that may go on. But just know if you're a staff member that um, volunteers are watching that and wondering what's going on. So as quick as it gets resolved, then uh you know, each of those people need to go to any volunteers they have and say, hey, I know, you you know, you saw us huddling up. This is what we were talking about. We're going to um, change, you know, this and we're going to put this song before, you know, the other song or whatever. The thing is. And no big deal. You know, just wanted to let you know what was going on. That that way, volunteers don't wonder, well, what were they talking about it? something wrong with the last service or whatever. So I know, I know you got to huddle up from time to time, but, uh, you know, clarity is a gift. Turn, turn right around and say, um, hey, you know, we're going to make a, a little change here. 
Um, of you, but you may notice it. So this is, you know, this is what we're doing. Yeah. That, um, that, uh, communication after that huddle, that's something that I've always tried to figure out like the best way to do that because inevitably you always miss someone like, yeah, <laughs> dang, that person, they were in the bathroom or whatever. And, and it's like, they really needed to know that we're moving, you know, the plasma during prayer instead of title pack. And it's like, well, I didn't see them. Um, not that that's an excuse, excuse or anything like that, but I, I have been, th- I'm like, do we create an app? Do we do like a mass text message? Like I've always like been trying to figure out what that is, especially at, at larger campuses, um, mm-hmm. you know, or, uh, depending on how your auditorium is set up, like the control rooms way over here, stages over this way, like people are, well, after sort of, you know, breakfast and sort of run through people are just poof, scattered. Yeah. Um, and so I've always sort of tried to figure out and I haven't figured it out yet, um, how best to communicate that, um, out after, but I, I completely agree that that's wildly important because I, I definitely don't want you feeling that you didn't send up the uh, person in time or you sent him up too soon when he just popped off his chair and went up. So it's, it's definitely interesting. Yeah. And, um, uh... A, if you've assigned a volunteer a particular uh, task or a particular job or something like that, make sure that all of the staff team knows that, uh, okay, you know, I'm going to have um, Joe bring the plasma out. I mean, most staff members are, are great about this, but every now and then you'll run across one that just feels in their heart that, you know, Joe just can't do that quite as well as I can. And he goes, you know, sitting over there when he knows when the queue is, staff member will be pulling the, the plasma out. That is one of the quickest ways to run volunteers off. Um, is, is give them a job and then not let them do it. <laughs> oh, hundred yes, hundred percent. Well and and I know I I want to make sure if I'm asking someone to be there that they have something worth their time to be there. Exactly. You know, like, well, I mean, we'll have sometimes long conversations like, hey, do we need to ask more stagehands to be here because we have X, Y, and Z on stage? And most of the time, it's no, let's put a staff member with them to help clear because I I definitely don't want to ask another stagehand to come to move a lamp because just we didn't have enough hands. But, but I think what you were mentioning is maybe even a little worse that, that, because that volunteer sees that they're not trusted and nobody likes that. Right. Uh, and that, that's really good to consider and to watch out for, um, as a staff member, for sure. Baptisms are, are another situation where sometimes that uh, kind of gets confusing because of course, you know, a staff member, a pastor is going to be the one doing the actual baptism. Um, but during the run through, you may, you know, want to have a volunteer, uh, for, you know, purposes, stand, you know, stand up the do the mic check and everything. Be sure and let them know that, you know, this, this is just for a run through and I got something, you know, something else I need you to do during the service or you'll go back to, you know, your regular position during the service. But if you'll help us out during the run through and just, you know, there again, it's a clarity thing. Yeah, um, communication. Be involved in, you know, in the dunk because they're not. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're we're not asking you to baptize. Uh, right. We just need you. To, you're a stand-in for a rehearsal. That's interesting. I, uh, man, okay, good. Yeah, that's good to know because you normally we just have like the stage manager ask one of the stage hands to go stand in. But I, sure. I guess it's never really occurred to me that hey, they need to know that that they need to go back and do their normal thing. Yeah. Yeah. And usually, you know, a newer person that, you know, if you ask them to do it, maybe they're not quite, maybe they haven't, you know, been uh, on the, the cruise on a day that we're doing a baptism or baptism or whatever it is. It's a new experience for them. So, as long as, you know, you just take time to let them know what's going on. This is what's been going on during the run through, during the, you know, pastor, whoever is going to be doing, doing this part. 
What, um, from your experience, both being on staff and as a volunteer, what are your thoughts on how much you can ask a volunteer? Like, have you seen that line get sort of grayed with some people or like, um, have you seen people not being asked enough or have you seen people being asked too much, um, as a volunteer? Um, cause I feel like, um, that definitely ebbs and flows with staff members. Like, Hey, they're just a volunteer. We can't ask them to do that. Or, Hey, um, we need them here every week, but they're volunteer, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. That, um, that kind of gets tricky. Especially if you have uh, a volunteer or volunteers who have a particular skill set that um, that you you need quite often, like uh, you know, um, front of house, or you know, they they're with the operating the lighting console or something like that. Call on them uh, a little more, or or at least want to, but. Um, be sure and communicate with them and say, you know, hey, you're, um, you, you've really got a, a great skill set on this. Would, would you be willing to serve, uh, you know, two Sundays a month instead of just one or, um, three Sundays a month or, you know, whatever and just see what they're, they're doing. Some of them are in a, a situation with their regular job where they can't. Um, as a firefighter, I had to, had to work every third Sunday because that's just the way it's rotated around. And so I would, you know, would have to say, um, I can, can give you the Sunday I can be here. And if, if you know, please reach out to me. But on these that I have, have, uh, blocked out, there's no way I can working at the fire station. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a last minute call on those Thursdays or on those Sundays. Uh, it's you know the um, the level of engagement of the volunteer themselves is uh, is a key to that. If they're you know if they come, uh, they serve one Sunday a month, and they come and you know do their thing on that Sunday, but the other three Sundays you don't see them at all. You know even in church you, you don't hear from them or whatever. And you know maybe. I, who knows what the reason for that? Maybe our online presence is so great that they would rather stay home in their pajamas and watch. But the way the volunteer reacts to the task that they're given when they are there, you can kind of get a clue if they want to do more. And some of them, you know, will just come right out and say, you know, hey, I would love to learn how to operate a camera. You know, can I come maybe to rehearsal or something and shadow a camera operator? If it's somebody that's asking to do more, then um, that's a good good candidate to allow them to do more. Yeah, one hundred percent. I've never felt, um, especially you know, in the in the north, being part of the North Point organization, I've never felt like uh, I was being taken advantage of or asked to, to do anything that um, that a staff member you know probably should be doing because they're. I mean, there, there have been situations where I've been uh, scheduled for a Sunday and uh, something, you know, changed. And, you know, they shot me an email and said, hey, we're not going to be doing any stage transitions this Sunday. So just wanted to let you know, you know, you're welcome to come hang out, have breakfast with us and everything. But we don't need don't need you in the stage manager position. That's fine. That's you know a change that happened during the planning meetings during the week, and and it's a legit you know thing that happened. No big deal. But uh, you know, like I said, don't schedule somebody to to be there and do a task and 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 take it away from them after they they are have somebody else do it. So have a staff. That's, yeah, it's terrible. That's like the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, think the I think maybe the. the I don't know if it's worse, but maybe like the second worst thing is like getting scheduled to do something one time and then never getting scheduled to do that thing again and back Ooh. to your normal thing. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I'm just not a very good camera op, but I think I did camera like one time and then yeah. I was back doing pro presenter the rest of the time. So it's yeah. like, all right, which I mean, I, pro is great. That's what I, that's what I did when I, I volunteered, I, I volunteered up running pro lyrics on the screens, but I think I did this, the handheld cameras one time and, um, 
I don't know. I must not have did a very good job because they never put me back there. <laughs> yeah. So pro presenter is a is a unique skill set itself. But the timing on that with the with the music and everything, you've got to be on point or people know that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and they let you hear about it too. Don't oh, yeah. They? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's too early or it's it's late or hey, we need to go black. Like we don't want it up there. That yeah. There's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I got a I got another weird thing to bring up if you don't mind me throwing this out Go there. Go for it. No. When you have new people coming in, new volunteers coming in, some churches have I call them moral imperatives for volunteers. Now some of them are are pretty obvious. Um we you know, we don't want people doing our worship services who were out you know, uh, at a club last night and, you know, doing drugs and just, you know, things like that. Some of the moral imperatives are pretty obvious, but some are not, not quite so obvious. And if your church has any of those moral imperatives, uh, well, I'll give you an example. There was a young lady uh, on a guest services team at a church um, that I was at one time who um, she was a great volunteer. She's there uh, almost every Sunday, probably every other Sunday serving. And she moved up to sort of a team lead or an area lead. You had several people that, that were under her that she communicated with and other things. And um, just a uh, wonderful young woman, uh, very outgoing, very, you know, great personality and everything, um, engaged to be married and very happy in life, the whole bit. And uh, all of a sudden, she just sort of disappeared, you know, just just stopped coming. And um, I asked, you know, one of the people that uh, that I was close with that worked on her team, um, I said, hey, what happened to Sosa? I haven't seen her around. And they said, oh, they uh, kind of fired her. And I said, What? <laughs> And yeah, someone, you know, in the, on staff, I guess it was, found out that she was engaged to be married, but she was living with her fiance. And that was something that was just unacceptable in that church. And so dismissed her in a, a rather uh, direct way that was, uh, that was pretty hurtful to her and to the people that she had gotten to know, you know, on the, on the, um, the guest services team. So if there are those, you know, those moral imperatives that are just a, you know, a part of the, the church, they're organic to that, uh, that organization, um, be up front with new people when they come in so that they know that, you know, if pink socks are not allowed on Sundays, then they'll know not to wear pink socks. And, and, you know, like I say, that, that was something that came up uh, for me in a weird way. But I definitely put it in the third brain cell on the left and for people coming up. So that way, you know, as a fellow volunteer, if I know that someone is maybe, you know, uh, maybe in a, a recovery program, say, but they haven't complete churches sometimes want to wait until people have, you know, gotten a, to a certain level, gotten, you know, a, a, a chip or something like that before they let them participate. I would put my arm around them and say, hey, just wanted to let you know about this so that, you know, if it comes up, which I hope it does, I don't want you to get blindsided. By yeah. It. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I know we, we do background checks and stuff like that. And uh, I guess like just setting the expectations up front for the volunteer, I don't think uh, we as an organization have that kind of thing for production, at least. Yeah. There's very few things that are going to exclude you from being on the production team, volunteer production team that I'm aware of. But, but I, but I think you're right. Like, but that, that's just my organization. That's not every church in the U S and so just being up front with your volunteers about right. what we expect. Yeah. hundred percent. Like um, I know a, a few of the things, I mean, it's not a moral imperative, but some of the things that uh, volunteers get surprised about um, especially if they're maybe already volunteering and maybe looking around, uh, for production is that we ask the production volunteers to be there for both services mm-hmm. and uh, for a rehearsal in the morning. So like we ask a lot of our production volunteers way more hours than, you know, guest services or, or any of the kids men do. 
Um, And that that's something that people have been like, oh, uh, I can't do both services. And it's like, I don't I don't know what to tell you. Like, that's what we that's what we do. And, you know, that's what we ask. We and we can't really make exceptions to that. Or, well, we choose not to, I should say we choose not to. But uh, but yeah, no, that's good. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it keeps the consistency there Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the uh, throughout those services. Mm -hmm. If you have the same team, it's just just that simple. Yeah. Yeah. And and, um, I I wish there was a way to do that, but just coming in and and knowing what we're doing for the whole service, it's not something that we can just swap a team in between the 915 and 1115. Um, I have found in some churches, though, and I have the result. (laughs) <laughs> how did how did that how did that how, well how did how did how did that work like can it work did it work no okay <laughs> it it worked um we you know we got through both services but there was a totally different vibe in both and it was what what's really weird to me was the uh the band was exactly the same for both but um, uh, the video production, the you know the switching and things like that, totally different. And the timing was too. There were there were um, gaps between parts of the services. And uh, I found out later that the pastor who was speaking at uh, one service that's what changed too. Past, one pastor spoke at the early service, different pastors uh, at the later. Was service. it was it like a traditional service first? hour and contemporary service like second hour kind of thing or was it yeah pretty much okay all right yeah there's two different kinds of services so to be fair there were going to be some some uh some differences anyway but um this at this particular church they uh rather than having a a team who was responsible for um calling the shots if you will planning the service and executing the plan um, the pastor at this church said, you know, basically said that, you know, my church, this is how I want it done kind of thing. So we said, okay, you got it, Toyota. <laughs> Man. <laughs> and yeah, um, uh, it didn't work well. <laughs> no, I, I've not had an experience of like switching a, a whole production team between services, but I have, you know, I've been involved with very traditional service at like the nine first hour and then, we have half an hour to switch and do like a little contemporary, more contemporary thing. But that was still with the same production team, same camera ops and same guy switching and stuff like that. So I, I can't imagine having to switch over the service and switch over production. That is that is foreign. Foreign to me, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it should but, stay that way. <laughs> do I? Just, it should stay that way. <laughs> My personal opinion, but yeah, it's... I think the system that, you know, that we have, uh, is a good one. It does require, um, more hours from people who volunteer to be, uh, on the production team. But, you know, like I say, that's communicated up front. Um, it's, it's very clear. And the reason we do it is to, you know, to maintain the consistency, but also maintain the, you know, the high quality. Yeah. Well, and, and I can't imagine, uh, cause I know even with our, you know, some of our volunteers on pro and, uh, camera and stuff like that, they, they only serve maybe once a month, the next time that they serve, you know, like they're not racking up hours on the gear. So it's, it's almost like having to get back into the mindset and then for them to only do that for like 30 minutes, like you're not going to sort of progress in, in that skill very quickly if you're doing that half an hour once a month. So, right. I mean, I agree that our, what we've asked our volunteers to do is, is, is helpful. They get more time on the gear, more ability to get notes and train and stuff like that. So, right. um, but that, that's, I mean, I think that's something that every production team strives to do is have people better on the equipment that they have and stuff like that, at least for a, a volunteer production team. Um, right. That is, that is something that we're always doing which speaking of like training nights coaching nights like what's been your your experience uh positive or negative with like those kind of uh those nights or stuff like that do you enjoy them or not or i'd love to hear more about that kind of thing too 
like out, oh. so volunteering the volunteer aspect outside of a Sunday morning. Like how's, how's that been for you? Yeah. Uh, we've had a couple of, of uh, training nights, if you will, for the uh, any, anybody, any volunteer who wants to come is, is welcome to. Um, we uh, did have a, a meal uh, and then, were encouraged to maybe go look at a different area that you know you're not familiar with. Um, if you if you want to learn it, speak up and say, "Hey, I'd like to learn how to do this." If you just want to see what the person who operates this this particular um, controller or board or whatever does, then um, you know, let them know, "Hey, I'm I'm just here to observe," and uh, and that went went really well. But we weren't able for for whatever reason and i don't know what the reason was we we didn't continue it we didn't follow up and you know do it do it again do it again do it again kind of thing to where it became a you know a routine that's a that's sort of a special occasion it's not you know something to to try and do you know even once a month really Uh, maybe once a quarter would be nice the fellowship was great because we you know, we got to chat with staff people that on Sundays a lot of times are um, really kind of, you know, kind of busy and kind of focused on on what they're doing. We, you know, got time to chat and say, you know, hey, um, how's your family doing? You know, how are the kids doing? How's the ball team? Kind of things like that. And I always enjoy that. But we do have other social activities for the, the production staff. Every year, uh, well, let's see. I don't know if they did it this year or not. I think that, yeah, I think they did. And I think I missed it. I was out of town or something, but they, you know, they rent go karts or something like that. Um, you know, they get out there and race go karts and do some fun things like that, which is, is really enjoyable. Uh, Gwinnett Church has a, has a great staff culture to begin with. And that trickles down to the volunteers because the volunteers see the staff. Um, representing their, you know, their area of responsibility well and representing themselves well, leading themselves well. And, um, they, you know, like I said, that, that trickles down. Uh, the volunteers feel well led and I think are willing to lead each other in, you know, in smaller steps, probably. But, uh, it's a, you know, like I said, it's a really good, good culture the the relationship between um, production and the the musicians at Gwinnett Church has always been great um, there's one table as, as you know in the green room there's not a, a table for the band over here and a table for production over there there's one table and everybody sits together everybody chats never run across um, you know the production team volunteer I've never run across a band member that uh, seemed you know like they didn't want to be bothered with, you know, with a production guy talking with them or whatever. It just, just doesn't happen. Everybody is, is, uh, is friendly, um, outgoing, and, uh, and, and really, you know, I, I think everybody cares about each other. We don't just say um, we really do because, uh, well, like this past Sunday, uh, one of our band members had a situation where a family member had a, had a pretty serious uh, medical situation and uh was in the hospital recovering from it and everything but this and this band member you know just just said hey you know if, if you would pray for my dad you know he's uh, in a bad way right now so instead of just saying okay we'll we'll pray for your dad we kind of stopped everything right there it was during our devotional time and the, the you know the person leading the devotion just stopped everything right there and said hey so we all gather up here and put our hands on this this member of our team and just pray for him. And uh, we did, we did that, and and uh, I told you know told him after it was over that um, that lifted me as much as I hoped it it lifted him, uh, and it got me you know got my my heart in the right place and, and ready for worship. That's a fantastic. Is that something that? that you can, you know, start fostering in your production team and staff culture, or is that something that sort of needs to be in sort of ingrained from the start? Cause I know going church has sort of always been that way a little bit. Yeah. Um, and through staff and stuff like that, it's, it's been able to stay that way, but not every church is like that. Not every church has 
band and production, all eating breakfast together, you know, that those kind of things. And um, I know, I know staff members and, and people are always thinking about that kind of thing. But yeah, I would, I would love to hear what you thought about that. I think it starts at the top. Um, whoever the, the point person is, which, you know, is the campus pastor, um, kind of sets the, sets the tone for the staff relations and the, you know, the staff, um, if they're, uh, blended together in just the right way, they'll pick that up and, and carry it on. And it just naturally flows down to the volunteers. So I'm not saying, you know, that the, um, the campus pastor is responsible for the entire culture, but if they, you know, have some, some things that are, uh, you know, I call them non-negotiable for their, their staff members, such as, you know, if, uh, if you, if you got an issue with, with somebody, you know, go to them directly and talk about it. Don't talk behind their back. No gossiping. Absolutely. It's, that's one of Dave Ramsey's things. If, you know, if you work for, uh, work for Dave Ramsey, you gossip in the office, you're fired. You're gone. <laughs> but, um, that, I mean, that's just, just an example. It, you know, it starts at the top and it rolls down from there and, and hope rolls, uh, rolls through, even through the volunteers so that the volunteers, I know the production volunteers, we don't have that much direct contact with the attendees, um, unless you know, we happen to say hi to them, you know, out, uh, before the service starts or whatever. Um, but still, it, you may, you know, bump into um, someone in the hallway. I do this often at Gwinnett Church. Between services, I'll just walk in the in the hall, and of course, I'm saying hi to, you know, friends and staff members that I know and everything. But every now and then, I'll see someone that I see, you know, looking around, looking reading the signs very carefully and I'll just go up to him and, and say, Hey, my name's Dennis. Um, can I, you know, can I help you find something? And almost always they're looking for uh Wombaland or up street or, you know, a good place to check their kid in. And uh, so I don't, I don't say, Oh yeah, you go down here and it's right around the corner, you know, and on your right, I'll say, come with me and, and I'll, you know, walk with them and, uh, and ask them, you know, um, is this, you know, have you been, been here before? Is this, is this your first time? Maybe this is your first time bringing the child. Um, to, you know, I'm, I'm taking you to Womba land. Uh, and just, you know, talk with them a little bit and make them feel welcome. I'm not a guest services member, but I know how to do that. I know how to be, be invitational and, and welcome somebody. That's new. That's, and I yeah, try and awesome. with a guest services member, you know, once they get their kid um, checked in, I'll, you know, I'll kind of hang up while they're doing that and say, hey, you know, um, can I, you know, maybe introduce you to Sally over here? She's with our guest services team. She'll be happy to, you know, find you uh, a good seat in the auditorium or whatever. I want to make that interaction with that new person as, as positive as it can be. Even though that's not the, you know, the role that I'm in on that particular morning, my role was, you know, as a speaker host, I could just sit in there, you know, with my headset on and wait for the service to begin. But that's not me. No, I, I think, I, yeah, it's great. I think where that comes from, it, well, it comes from, from my heart, but I think it was put in my heart by that culture that, that I saw around me so, because I see other people you know, doing the same thing. And it's like, you know, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to jump on that train. Yeah. Well, I really like what uh, Matt, uh, I mean, it's been years now, but the visible and available idea that, um, that he has the band sort of internalized, which uh, I think that trickles down. Well, I hope it does trickles down just our production volunteers too. And I've sort of thought about that as well. Like it's very easy for me to sit in the control room uh, you know, that's where I am most of the time, but like, I'd like our production volunteers to be visible and available as well, because, you know, you're not volunteering because you like to run a camera. You're, well, I mean, you might be, but like you're volunteering because that's your church. And right. we all have a part to be inviting to everybody. And um, I think it might be a disservice if you saw that person 
looking up and being like, Hey Sally, like that guy doesn't know where he's going. Yeah. I think we would miss the mark if that actually, if that happened. So thank you for doing that. Cause it, you know, Gwinnett church, Hamilton mill church, you know, we should all want the best for all of our churches. And that's fantastic. Dennis, I think this has been a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the, the green room podcast. We're getting this thing up and rolling. It's, it's been fun. And uh, I, yeah, I can't thank you enough for being a part of it. It's fantastic. It, it has been a pleasure. I've enjoyed the conversation and uh, uh, enjoyed the, the topics that we got to throw out there. And uh, I hope they benefit somebody somewhere, whether it's another production volunteer or, um, or a staff member somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I hope it's beneficial. I hope so, too. That's thank awesome. you. Thank you. Thank you.